In this message, we highlight the power of collective faith or agreement in faith. Among other things, our collective faith is a solid front, an impregnable wall of defense against enemy intrusion. All right, let's rise to our feet and make our declaration, and then we will spend some time in God's Word. And uh, I also want us to spend some time towards the end of this service for prayer together. We're going to pray for all the elections, the general elections are going on. So we'll keep some time towards the end of the service to pray after we've heard the word of God. So let's raise our Bibles high up in the air. Let's say this out loud, bold, and strong. This is God's word. This is God speaking to me. I am what God says I am. I can do what God says I can do. I will become everything God has promised. I'm saved, healed, delivered, redeemed. I am blessed, victorious, prosperous, triumphant. I'm a minister of God, a servant of Christ, and a channel of His blessing. To many people, I receive His word. I believe His word. And I live by His word. Christ is my master. And to Him, I am. An absolute surrender. I advance boldly to take new ground to extend God's kingdom. I have kingdom power and authority vested in me. The powers of darkness cannot hold me back or pin me down. The forces of the enemy cannot restrain me or contain me. The greater one is in me. God's power through me is more than what the devil can handle. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Why don't you turn around to people next to you, shake hands, give them a good smile, say hello, give them your name. Take a moment to get to know them and you may be seated, please. Now, last week we had the um, raffle draw, and the person who won the first prize was from my East Church, <laughs> and uh, he decided to give the whole thing back to the building funds. So we like, were like, "Wow, very generous!" You know, <laughs> so uh, that's really, uh, you know, and uh, I think it, it was just an exercise we went through, uh, and uh, you know, people just participated. Not, uh, we also got a very interesting testimony, and I, I'm not saying. Please don't misunderstand me sharing this testimony. I'm not doing this for you to give, all right? I'm just sharing the testimony because it's a testimony. Uh, there was one chaplain who, he's not part of APC, but when we announced the building project uh, in uh, July last year, so I think from August onwards, uh, he started contributing. And every month, he sends 5,000 rupees. Right? He gives checks. So he's a chaplain. That's not, it doesn't seem like, oh, wow. It doesn't seem like a whole lot of money. But for him, he's making the commitment. He's not coming to APC. He's not part of our, us. Every month, he's so faithfully every month, he's sending 5,000 rupees to the building funds. Then recently, he said, you know, the moment I, from the time I started doing this, I'm giving in thousands. God is giving me in lakhs. <laughs> and he was saying, he got a call from... Uh, some somebody who's, who's sponsoring his entire trip to the U.S. to go attend a conference, give him a chauffeur-driven car in the U.S., <laughs> and taking him, a, you know, paying for his trip to go meet some family that he has there. And so he was just saying, look, I started doing this, and God is blessing me like this. Amen? Amen. All right, so remember, I'm sure not sharing it to <laughs> get you to give. I'm just sharing it as a testimony because this is what he shared. He was so excited. And uh, what touched my heart was, you know, he's just doing what he can. Just 5,000 rupees a month, right? But the fact is that didn't hold him back. He said, okay, and he is not part of APC, but he's, you know, he, he reads our books and other things. So uh, he's been blessed in some way to the church. And so he's giving. Uh, whatever he can, and, and, and God is just uh, doing wonderful things for him. I just wanted to share that uh, just to uh, encourage us. Uh, we are continuing to talk about faith, 
uh, and in the, this message, this, this part 9, uh, 28 will be our last message uh, in the series just to cover the things we wanted to cover in this, uh, uh, in this round of faith. I'm sure we'll be talking about faith many times over in the journey ahead. Uh, but in this message, uh, we're titling it The Power of Collective Faith. All along, we've been talking about our personal faith, our individual faith. In this message, we want to touch on another aspect of faith, which is collective faith. Us being in agreement in faith on certain matters. So I've kept some time for prayer at the end, so we will practice this message before we leave. Right? We want to pray for the elections going on in our country and so on. But let's hear the word first. It will encourage us, and then we will pray together. We, want, we, want, we need to understand this aspect of faith, of collective faith, of people coming in agreement in faith. Uh, we will start off in Matthew chapter 18, verses 18 and 19. Again, these are familiar verses to us, but it's good to just uh, go back and read them. Matthew chapter 18, verses 18 and 19. Jesus said, Assuredly I say to you, Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now, we know that he stated these same words in a, in, a, in a previous chapter, in Matthew 16. He stated the same words, and here he is repeating it in Matthew, 6, Matthew 18, verse 18. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now, the English rendition of this, this word seems to imply that, you know, we do it first on earth, then it happens in heaven. But actually, uh, it's the other way. We lose on earth what has been loosed in heaven. When you look at the Greek and you look at it, how it's been put, this is how it would read. And we permit on earth what has or what God permits in heaven. So that's us praying on earth as it is in heaven. So we, know, we need to know the mind of God. This is what God allows, this is what God disallows, and he has wasted authority in the church, in us as God's people, to bring that here on earth. That means we allow or we disallow on earth what God allows or God permits or what God prohibits in heaven. Are you with me? That's the authority vested in the church for, for us on earth. Then he says in verse 19, again I say to you, if two of you agree on earth as touching anything that they ask, it shall be done by my Father who is in heaven. And I want to just bring our attention to a couple of things in verse 19. He says, again, I say to you. Now, when he uses that phrase, again, I say to you, he is basically repeating what he said prior to this in another form. So he says in verse 18, you can bind on earth, you can release on earth. But again, I'm saying, I'm telling you now, I'm saying the same thing, but here's how you do it. Are you understanding that? This binding and losing, I'm saying the same thing to you one more time, but this is how it's, it's going to be practiced. How? If two of you agree, that word agree in the Greek is again very interesting. It's symphonia, like our English word symphony. Like a big orchestra that's harmonizing in symphony. It's, it's, we're all, they're all just playing together. So if two of you harmonize on earth and they ask anything of my father who is in heaven. The implication there is you ask in faith because we are supposed to pray in faith. Jesus said in Matthew 21, verse 22, whatever you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. So that's implied, even though it's not stated. So we could read it like this. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree, you harmonize, you are in symphony, you are in one accord on earth, and concerning anything that you pray together in faith, it will be done. 
And that's how you bind. That's one way that you bind and lose on earth as it is in heaven. Are you understanding? But the key there is to be in agreement in faith. To be in a place of harmony. To be uh, in one accord concerning faith. And so that's why we've titled this message, Collective Faith. If two or more agree are in agreement and total harmony on this thing it will be done amen so now you and i as believers we need to tap into this we have numerous opportunities to tap into this think for a very simple example at home or when as husbands and wives or as families uh, you come together in prayer it's two or more And we can agree together. Be in harmony together concerning something. In your life groups, when you get together, it may be five, ten, some number like that. You're in together. You're all believers. You have an opportunity to come in agreement concerning something that you want to pray about. When we have... Uh, uh, when we pray for one another, we have prayer times. So we say, you know, sit down in twos and pray. Or we call people up and we have people up in front in twos or threes praying for others. When we go out on mission trips, when we go out on outreaches, when we go to the malls, uh, we go out in groups of twos or threes. These are all opportunities where we can tap into the power of collective faith. When together we agree on something. And Jesus said, it will be done by my Father in heaven. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 verse 9. We know that verse. Two. Let's read it. Two are better than one. Because they have a good re reward for their labor. Two are better than one. When we are in agreement. When we are able to harmonize. And uh, be together. Now let's look at collective faith in action. In the New Testament. In, in the book of Acts. Uh, I just want to bring our attention to. Uh, three scenarios, or three situations where believers came together in collective faith, in agreement in faith, and they saw amazing results. The first one is in Acts chapter 4, where we see them in prayer. Verses 23 and 24, we'll begin there. It says, and being let go, this is Peter and John. Uh, they had been apprehended by the, uh, the priests, and they were questioned, and they were threatened. Now they've been let go, so they go back to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. So when they had heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. So now notice, they go back to their own companions. They go back to the company of believers. Uh, they faced challenges. They're going back to their company. Now you and I have that. You can go back to your life group. You can go back to a few other believers. And they say, look, uh, here's the challenge I'm, I'm faced with. So they go back to their own company. And what do they do? They lift up their voice with one accord. That's symphony. That's harmony. Them raising up a prayer in agreement in collective faith. And they're saying, God, look, at, you know, you, you hear about all their threats. And you hear what they are saying against us. And I'm skipping a few verses, going down to verse 29. Here's what they pray. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done to the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. See, they prayed together. They raised their voice with one accord and they're praying. They said, God, here's what we want you to do. Give us boldness. Amen. Now imagine we, now just try to picture us as a church right there. In the book of Acts there, right there. That we are these people. That we are coming together in collective faith. And we are saying, God, give us you see now, they were not divided. They were not arguing, should we pray for boldness or not? Is it theologically right to do that or not? No, 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 no arguments. Let's just come in agreement on this. 
God, give us boldness. And what else? Lord, stretch out your hand to heal. Let signs and wonders be done in the name of your servant, Jesus. See, they are in agreement in this kind of prayer. You know, now when we as a church pray, God, we want to see signs and wonders. Now, the problem is somebody will be saying, uh, why do you want signs and wonders? <laughs> somebody else will say, hmm, uh, maybe signs and wonders ceased when the last apostle died. So we, we you know, and all these things leave, leave us in a place of disharmony. Are you understand? But we need to be like that church there where they could pray together and say with one accord. They were in harmony. They were in agreement on this issue. God, we are in agreement. We want boldness and we want to see the works of God. No, nothing else. Finished. With one accord, they pray. God, stretch out your hand to heal. Let signs and wonders be done in the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And you know, God responded. It says, as soon as they finished praying, the place was shaken. And they began to speak the word of God with boldness. Holy boldness gripped that entire company of believers. And I'm sure that in that company of believers, there must have been some young people. They're like, what kind of prayer is this? You know, They don't understand what's going on. There must be others who have been you know, just accidentally sitting there. Whatever. People with all different stages of growth and maturity. And they some understood, some may not have understood, but the holy boldness of God gripped their hearts. And as you read the very next chapter, in Acts chapter, five, Acts chapter 4, you continue reading right after that and into chapter 5, you see the answers to that prayer. Verse 33 says, with great boldness, the apostles gave witness. With great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. You go to chapter 5. It says, uh, you know, God dealt with the, uh, with the sin in the church. There was Ananias and Sapphira. They came to, you know, they tried to uh, misrepresent things. And the glory of God was there. Signs and wonders happened. They fell down dead. They prayed for signs and wonders. And then in that same chapter, in Acts 5, very next chapter, what happens? It says, uh, Peter was walking by and suddenly something happened. This shadow started healing people. They prayed for signs and wonders. God is answering. Never happened before. And so soon the news spreads. And uh, people from other cities are coming into Jerusalem, bringing sick people so that at least Peter's shadow would fall on some of them so that they could be healed. They prayed, God, give us signs and wonders. It's happening. But they prayed with one accord. Are you with me? Do you think we as a church could do like that? That we could come together in agreement in this place of harmony, in this place where we are in one accord on some issue, some matter. And we as a church, we've got so many things that we're praying for. So many things we're going through. Uh, and I said, God, we are in agreement on that. 100%. And if we are like that, he says, nothing can be withhold from us. He says, anything will take place. Look at another example in Acts when Peter was put in prison. Uh, King Herod. Uh, he had killed, he had just killed James, the brother of John, beheaded him. And then he get, got to Peter and put Peter in prison. So in Acts 12 verse 5 it says, Peter was therefore kept in prison. But let's see the rest of the verse. But constant prayer, let's read it together please. But constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. So think about this, Peter is in prison. What's the church doing? Praying. Now, it doesn't tell us what they prayed, how they prayed, so on. But we can just assume that they were all together in agreement. And I'm sure they're praying, God, keep Peter alive, get him out. There's not like, should we pray, maybe he's staying there for <laughs> some time. Maybe God wants, to, God wants him to spend the rest of his life in prison. No, they were in agreement. God, we are praying. Doesn't tell us there, but I'm assuming, and I'm thinking it's, I think it's safe to assume they're praying, God, get him out. 
And that's exactly what happens in a supernatural way. An angel of the Lord comes to Peter in the prison, brings him out. The answer was so amazing that even the praying church was surprised, was shocked. Verse 12, it says when, uh, you know, when Peter had come out of the prison, the angel, angel of God had brought him out. It says when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. So they were praying. And he's knocking on the door. Hello, I'm here. The answer has come. Look, another example. In Acts 14, verses 19 to 22. Then the Jews from Antioch and Iconium came there. And having persuaded the multitudes, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. So Paul had come to this city of Lystra. And he was preaching there. And uh, people uh, from Antioch and Iconium and other cities nearby, they came over to Lystra to cause trouble. They gathered a mob who came and they stoned Paul. That was the same thing Paul did to Stephen when he killed Stephen. Now when, they say, when the Bible says they stoned Paul, don't think they threw one stone like that. I mean, this was a real stoning. You can only imagine... How badly bruised his body must have been. And after stoning him, they dragged his, his body out of the city. They didn't carry it or anything. They dragged it out. And they left his body out there supposing him to be dead. Now that's the condition. The next verse tells us, Acts 14 verse 20, however... When the disciples gathered around him. What happened? He rose up, went into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derby. And when they preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, went on to Iconium, on to Antioch, strengthening the souls uh, of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith, saying, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. Now think logically. A person being stoned, dragged out, and left as dead, even if he managed to be alive, and he went through a normal recovery process of, you know, having all his wounds bandaged and everything, probably would have taken four months to recover. At least. But the Bible says, when the disciples gathered around him, it does not tell us what they did, what they said, nothing. The disciples gathered around him. Here's a man who had been stoned and left as dead. He's rising up. He's walking back. It doesn't say he was carried back. He went back to the city. The next day he's back on the road. He's traveling to Derby. Not for medical treatment. He's there to preach the gospel. Win souls. And from there he's back to Lystra, Iconium, Antioch. All busy scheduled back on it. Are you understanding? So let's go back to that. When the disciples gathered around him. What did they do? We don't know. But you can, be, you can safely assume. When these disciples came around Paul. They were there in one accord. They were there in perfect agreement. And I don't think anybody was praying, God, take him home. We release him to you. God bless him. He has served his time. I don't think anyone was praying like that. They were around him and they said, God, raise him up. There he comes up. Instantly he comes up. Healed, whole, and he's on his way. Are you understanding what happens when two or more come together in agreement, in collective faith, or in agreement in faith? What amazing things can happen. So church, I want to invite us into this place in God. This place in our 
journey of faith that's available to all of us as God's people to a place where as believers we can bind and lose on earth. That we can dictate what happens on earth. Because that kind of authority has been vested in you and me as God's people. But there is this requirement. We must be in agreement in faith. Then we ask our Heavenly Father. If two or more, ask. Amen? Do you think it's possible or do you think this will happen only way to get to heaven? You see, when we get to heaven, we don't need all this. We need it this side of heaven, right here and now. So each one of us must do what we can to be that great orchestra of believing people, of people in faith. This great symphony of people in faith, believing God for various things. When we say, let's be a church where the miracles of God will manifest, let's be in agreement about it. When we say we want to be a church where uh, we can grow to thousands of people and impact our city and impact our nation. Let's be in agreement on that. Amen. Let's be in agreement. Because we need to agree if we're going to see it happen. Another powerful aspect of this collective faith or agreement in faith we see in the church at Colossae. So we go to Colossians chapter 2 verses 4 and 5. Colossians chapter 2 verse 4 and 5. Paul is writing to the believers at Colossae. He writes this in verse 4. Now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. For though, verse 5, for though I'm absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order, and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. Now one of the challenges that they confronted the early church. And perhaps confronts the church today as well. Was heresy. Wrong ideas. Wrong preaching. Wrong teaching coming in. Infiltrating into the church. And that's why in verse 4 Paul says. You know I, I'm saying this because I don't want anybody to deceive you. With, with all kinds of words. I, I, want, I want this church to be secure against these kinds of things. Heresies and wrong teachings coming in. But then he's commending these believers in verse 5. He says, you know, look, though I'm not there in, in the flesh, in the spirit, this is what I see about you, uh, you church in Colossae. He says, I see you stand in good order. And I see the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. That word order and steadfastness is very interesting. When you look at look them up in the Greek, they are actually military terms. So when he says, "I see you in good order," it's it's the picture of soldiers standing shoulder to shoulder in perfect line, in perfect discipline. That's good order. It's a military term. I'm seeing you as a church. You are in good order. You are you know in line. No one breaking line. No one breaking discipline. You're all in your places. And that word steadfastness literally means a solid front. I am seeing the steadfastness of your faith. I am seeing the solid front that is put up by your faith. Now he's talking to the church community. He's not talking to an individual believer. He's saying, as a church community, your faith has put up a solid front. It's an impregnable wall of defense that has been put up by you as a community so that these things of the enemy will have no way and will not be able to make any intrusion into this church. Are you understanding that? So now, here's another aspect of what collective faith can do for us as a community, as believers. When we are in agreement in faith, our faith now becomes an impregnable wall against anything that the enemy is trying to intrude or bring into us. We have a solid front put around us, on a wall of defense. When we have this kind of faith. When we are in agreement with faith, in faith. 
Amen? So we, as, as, all right, I didn't hear a single amen. Either you're asleep or <laughs> you're still, <laughs> amen? All right. So imagine if we as believers, I'm excited, I don't know about you, but, <laughs> but we as believers are in agreement in faith. Our faith becomes an impregnable wall that protects our entire community of believers. We raise up a wall of faith and say, devil, we don't want anybody sick in this community. We will not tolerate sickness and disease and infirmity. We want every person healed and well. We will not tolerate any evil work. We want God's goodness and God's bless for every person in this community. That's our faith. And we put out a solid front of faith against any work of the enemy that's contrary to the will and the purpose of God in this community. It's a solid front. When we are in agreement in faith. And this wall or this solid front of faith is not only for defense, it's also for offense. When we studied Ephesians 6 a couple of years ago, we, we understood how uh, the Roman soldiers, their shield was a fully, a full, um, full length shield. And they used it not only to defend themselves, but when they came in formation, perfect alignment, and they, were, they had the shields all lined up together, shields all up uh, over them, it was like a, a, it, was an, a, it was a method of offense. They advanced against the enemy. It's like a military tanks rolling in to enemy territory. So their shields of faith was not only for defense, but also for offense. They could advance against the enemy with their solid front of faith. I understand. So when we are in collective faith, we can say, we are taking new ground and the enemy will not be able to stop us. Together with our collective faith, we can say we are buying land and the devil has no dispute over this. We've decided to buy land. We've decided to build. We're going to build. We've decided to become thousands. We've decided to plant churches across the country. We've decided to be a salt and light in our city. We've decided to be a voice to our nation. We've decided to be a voice to the nations. This is a decision we've made. We are, and our faith is together on this. We have a solid front of faith. An impregnable wall against the enemy. And we are advancing. The enemy cannot stop it. Amen. That's the kind of community we need to be. A solid front of faith. I like to read this verse from the Amplified Bible. Brings this out. It says, for though I am away from you in body, yet I am with you in spirit. Delighted at the sight of your standing shoulder to shoulder in such orderly array. And the firmness and the solid front and steadfastness of your faith in Christ. So the Amplified Bible brings out the meaning of those words. It's powerful. And our faith, our collective faith, our agreement in faith should keep on increasing. Like we saw last Sunday in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 3. Paul is writing to the believers in Thessalonica, the church there. And he's saying, we are bound to thank God always for you brethren. As it is fitting, because your faith grows exceedingly. Your faith as a community of believers is growing, is increasing. And he's talking about collective faith. Your faith is growing exceedingly. Of course, each one of them was growing up individually. But as a community is saying, your faith is growing exceedingly. These people, they can believe God for big things. Amen. Now that's what should be said about us. Our faith is growing. Here's a community of believers whose faith is in God is growing. They're doing bigger and greater things uh, through their faith in God. Their faith is growing exceedingly. Collective faith. So we need to guard, in, in, in guard against things that would destroy collective faith. And I just want to mention a few. We could probably make a list and identify things that... Uh, Bring disharmony in faith. But just think about a few things. 
think about murmuring and complaining. Are uh, we, uh, you know, let's pray, but oh, it's too hot here, or whatever, you know. We can murmur and complain about all kinds of things. But you know, there is priority, but there is higher priority. For example, excellence is a priority, but unity is a higher priority, right? So if something is not excellent, it's okay. I mean, yes, we want to address it. We want to get better. But don't let that disturb a higher priority of unity. Because that's very important. That's crucial. Us being in one accord is, of, is, is an essential thing in us as a community. We need to be in unity, agreement. So let go. Uh, we will address things that need to be addressed, but don't worry about it. Our competition and strife. Look, we are all in different stages of growth, spiritual growth. There's no need to compete. No, I'm, I'm, I have more faith than you. <laughs> Our God always answers my prayer. Yours 50%, that person 25%. Look, forget all those things. No competition. We're not here for that. We are all growing. Yes, there are people in different stages. Uh, there are people who are still learning. That's okay. But we're not here to compete. And we're not here to get into strife with each other. Or think about self and pride and jealousy. Or why is God using him and God not using me? Or, you know, all these things. No, no, relax. God's kingdom is so big. There's plenty of space for everybody. Amen. There's so much of work to be done. We all can get to do something. So don't fight over why I'm not doing this and I'm not. No, relax. There's plenty of room. The, the, the harvest fields are so big. So let's keep these things out because we want to protect our collective faith because there's tremendous power there. The enemy knows it better than we do. And for a long time, he's been successful in keeping us apart. But when we understand, we receive our understanding of this, and we say, no, we are going to come together in agreement and faith. We are going to stand together in collective faith. We are going to put up a solid front in, a, in, in this a collective faith. The enemy knows we are dangerous. Amen? Last thought I want to address before we get into time of prayer. Is ministering as teams with collective faith. You know, many, a lot of ministry happens as teams. When you go on mission trips, you'll be ministering as a team. And when you're praying for people, you'll be two or three of you praying together. When you go to the malls uh, to do early evangelism, you'll be two or three of you praying together. In your life group, you're ministering as a team. So in all of these scenarios, we are ministering as teams and Jesus himself. Taught his disciples to minister in teams. Look, look for example, Mark 6, verse 7. It says, when he called the twelve to himself and began to send them out. How? Let me hear you, please. Two by two. So he sent them out as teams. Teams of two. And gave them power over unclean spirits. So they went out and preached that people should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with all many who were sick and healed them. So the disciples had to learn how to flow together as they minister to people. I mean, just try to imagine James and John. James goes, the, the blind man comes, you know. James says, I will call thunder. And John says, no, I'll call lightning. You know? I mean, like, they're trying to do, impress each other, do better, out, outdo each other. I don't think that happens. James and John, they may be sons of thunder. But when it came for ministry, they flowed. As one. You can imagine when blind man comes to prayer. You know, Peter prays five minutes. Andrew saying, oh, he did five, no? I'll do seven. The blind man is saying, oh, please get over with your prayer. I don't think they were in such competition. They flowed together. The goal was, let's get the blind man healed. It doesn't matter who prays. Let's get him healed. So they flow together. Even the 70 disciples that Jesus sent out, he sent them out to do work as teams. In Luke chapter 10, verse 1, it says, 
After these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also and sent them, again, let's read it together, two by two before his face into every city and every place where he himself was about to go. He said, go out as teams, two by two, pray, minister. And they came back, verse 17, with a good report. It says, then the 70 returned, verse 17, with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. They came back with results. Lord, all of us saw it. Demons are subject to us. We saw healing. We saw miracles. So two by two, they went. And, and in collective faith, in an agreement in faith, they saw the results. They came back with rejoicing. And we must learn to do that. But we minister. There are times we call our leaders up to pray, you know, form groups of two or three and just pray for people. Uh, at various scenarios, you're going to be praying in teams. And so please keep this in mind. We need to nurture and protect authentic team ministry. That means we are not in competition with each other. So when we are praying together, just remember we're not in competition with each other. You got to be in perfect alignment and agreement, harmony, symphonize, be together, harmonize, be together. So it doesn't matter who's doing the praying. You're not in competition. But so don't uh, stand together in perfect agreement, avoid spiritual superiority, encourage everyone to participate. There may be some people who say like, man, do I, am I supposed to lay my left hand on my right hands? Uh, how do I pray? That's okay. Get them involved. Because that's how they're going to learn. I understand. So like what? You don't know which hand to use. You're coming to meet me to pray. What are we going to see? No, don't, don't be like that. Get everybody to participate. Just be in agreement as you minister. Are you understanding this? We need to develop this. We need that mindset where, Lord, it's important for us to be in agreement in prayer. Now, I want to address something here uh, just because sometimes we get a wrong idea of things in the Bible. Sometimes we think that the little faith of somebody will hinder the strong faith of the other. So say, so you have little faith, stay there. When I pray, don't come close to me. Because your little faith will hinder my great faith. I mean, nothing can be further from the truth. I mean, think about Jesus. He was in a boat with 12 unbelieving disciples. One man in faith, 12 unbelieving disciples, and the boat didn't sink. Amen. Amen. None of the twelve believed. They were saying, Lord, we are dying. The boat sailed. And numerous occasions like that, when he wanted to feed the 5,000, you think all the disciples were in faith? I don't think so. One was thinking about the bakery. Lord, <laughs> how many bakeries should we go to to get food for all of these? Another was thinking about the money. He had done his calculation. He said, Lord, even if we have so much money, where can we buy? So they're in faith. They're trying all kinds of things. And all Jesus says, you get, get me the five, Lord, what do you have? And look at the miracle. So you'll see numerous examples where the disciples of Jesus, Jesus' own team did not believe. But that didn't stop the miracle. Didn't stop. So don't despise somebody who, who may be young in faith, who may seem to have little faith. Don't put them away and say, look, your little faith is going to hinder my great faith. Big deal. Look at Jesus. Now one of the worst examples that people use is when Peter goes, or I, I shouldn't say worst, but an unnecessary example that people use is when Peter, when Jesus goes to raise up Jairus' daughter, when he goes in there only with Peter, James, and John. And they say, see, he didn't take the other nine. They didn't believe. So he left them away. So he was, you know, he only took these people and went and prayed to raise up Jesus. So therefore, only people strong faith come. All the others stay out. No. Try to understand this. 
Jesus and his 12 disciples, he had an inner circle. He had three of his closest friends, Peter, James, and John. It doesn't mean they were more spiritual. It doesn't mean they were of greater faith. In fact, when you look at it, the evidence in the Gospels, they were not necessarily of greater faith. Think about the other recorded occasions when Jesus was alone with Peter, James, and John. One was on the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew 17. There, the, Jesus is transfigured and Moses and Elijah appear. And what is the response of Peter, James, and John? Lord, we'll build you three tents. Will you all stay here? I mean, like, any sense? You want God to be in a tent here? <laughs> or the other time you have Peter, James, and John with Jesus alone, it's in the Garden of Gethsemane. So he leaves the nine. He says, Peter, James, John, come. Let's pray. And what happens? All 12 are sleeping. All 12 fall asleep. So Peter, James, and John were not superior to the others. So if you look, read the account of Jairus in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you'll find in Luke, Luke alone says this. He says, you know, as this crowd was following Jesus and the woman with the issue of blood was healed and, um, uh, and Jairus got the news that his daughter had died, what did Jesus do after he told Jairus, fear not, only believe? Then he told the crowd to stay back. Crowd, we are all not going to Jairus' house. You all stay here. He left the nine with the crowd. And then he said, Peter, James, and John, come with me. So what do you think the nine were doing? I'm assuming, it's not stated, but I'm assuming they were ministering to the crowd. It's not there. You can't disprove it. I can't prove it. <laughs> but I'm assuming, because he trained them to preach a minister. So the nine are probably healing the sick, casting out devils, handling the crowd so that Peter can go now, or Jesus can go now with Peter, James, and John, go to Jairus' house and do the work there. They're doing the work there. It is not that he took Peter, James, and John saying, these are the only men I have with great faith. The others are all little faith. Keep them out. They will hinder our faith. Maybe the daughter won't rise up. None of that. Are you understanding? So please don't get into this superiority of faith and think that you've got to drive out all the people of little faith so that your great faith can work. That's not right. We must encourage people. Come alongside. Let's pray. Yes, Jesus got rid of the musicians and mourners. That's a different story. But we're not talking about them. We're talking about his own disciples. We're talking about believers. Get them involved. So in authentic team ministry, let's get everybody to participate. Are you understanding? The important thing for, is for us to come to a place of agreement. I want to close with this testimony. I just want to make a disclaimer here. I do not have all the medical details of this testimony. I'm sharing it with you because uh, the person came back with details. Um. Uh, he, there was a young man, he, uh, he, they don't, this family doesn't come to APC, so you won't, don't try to think who it is. They don't come here. Uh, he was found with a brain cancerous tumor in his brain a few months ago. Uh, they were at a Jane Hospital. Uh, they did three surgeries on him, radiation, all of that. I mean, they took all the medical help they could get. But his tumor kept coming back and, and, uh, uh, and so on. And it, and after all of this, they reached out to us. They came to our church office. I said, yes, you can come. So I remember this was on Saturday, the 16th of Feb. Uh, this young man came. His father had come. His, his young man, maybe late, late 20s, 20s. So his wife was They had probably just married recently. His wife was there. They came. Uh, he could hardly walk. So doctors had done everything. They said, no, we can't do anything more. But he's too young to die. So they came to the church office. So we had him sitting there. Now I could have prayed myself. Not that I'm afraid to pray. I could have prayed. But I said, Pastor Ziggs, I went to call Pastor Ziggs, come. I went and called Samuel. I said, Sam, come. We're going to be in agreement for his healing. I can tell you, we stood there, we prayed maybe, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes together 
but we were in agreement for him. Hundred percent. God may have only one objective. He's got to be healed perfectly. No competition. Who's praying longer prayer? This prayer, not no, no, no. Just relax. One objective. He's got to be healed. He's got to be well. The next day, so they took him back. The next day, Samuel went to look at him, uh, look him up. He said, the next day, he was normal. He started to remember names. He even started going for a walk with his wife. Next day. <laughs> then, April. That means now. So that was February, now April. Just last week, I think, verse here. He went for his checkup to the hospital. The reports were there were no cancer cell in his body. And the doctor said, we have never seen anyone who's gone through all of this, given up, and we've never seen anyone actually walk to hospital, feed himself, take, have a bath, and he's looking so healthy. His father called, please tell them what happens. Amen? I don't know all the details, but I'm just sharing you the testimony that came to us. Three of us stood in agreement. Amen? Now what if all of us stood in agreement with, for certain things as a church? Lay aside everything that unnecessarily causes disharmony. And let's come and say, God, one thing. I am in agreement for this. Whether it's healing, whether it's for somebody's healing, somebody's deliverance, uh, whatever miracle we are believing God for, uh, whatever we want to see happen in our city, happen in our nation. If we, if the church comes to this agreement, Jesus says, whatever you bind on earth, whatever you lose on earth, that's what will happen. That's the authority vested that Jesus Christ has vested in the church. But... We have to be in agreement, in a place of collective faith. Amen? So we're going to do that right now. I call our worship team up, please. We're going to first pray for our nation. We want to pray. The elections are going on around the country. But we want to pray, God, give us a government. That is good, that's righteous, that promotes harmony, that promotes peace. Take out anyone who's divisive, who's causing discord, disunity across the nation. God, take these people out. Give us people, give us a government that will bless our nation. Give us a government that will cause our nation to prosper. So just pray over our nation. We pray that God will touch our land and especially during this time and after that I want to just pray for people who need healing here and during that time I'm going to ask two people to go to the people who need healing All right, we're going to act this out we're going to do this so we're going to ask people who need prayer for healing to raise their hand they will, you'll have people raising their hand then I'm going to ask two believers two people just go to that person be in agreement when you pray for that person. God, we want that person well. Can we do that? All of us can do. You say, but I don't know which hand to lay any hand. <laughs> I've never done this before. It's okay. There's always a first time. I don't know what to pray. It's okay. Just say, God, heal him or her. Just simple words. It's not, the, you know, your words or how theological you sound. Look. God just wants two of you be in agreement for that person. Simple. Let's keep it simple. All right. So we're going to ask people to go around. Two of you. If you've never done it, do it for the first time this morning. Uh, you go pray for somebody who needs prayer. You, uh, all you have to do is ask the person, what shall we pray for? So two of you are standing there. The person will say, please pray for such and such matter. You don't have to get the full medical history. That's not needed. What to pray for? All right. Then one can, person can pray, one person minister, the other person be in agreement. So Lord, when that person is praying, 
I am saying yes, amen. I'm not saying no, you shouldn't be saying those words. You should be using these words. You should be praying like this. No, leave all that aside. Just be in agreement. He may be praying very simply. Father, heal this man. He said, God, yes, Lord. I'm in agreement. Or he may pray very sophisticated. I bind the spirit and cast it out. Whatever. Yes, Lord. I agree. See, different ones of us different pray differently. It's okay. But be in agreement. Can we do that? All right, let's stand to our feet, please. Well, let's pray for our nation, then we'll sing a song, then we'll pray for our healing here in this place. Let's just join our hearts together for our nation. Father, we are your church, the church of your son, Jesus. You've given us, Lord, the privilege of just binding and losing on earth. We stand here in agreement, God, today for India, Lord. God, we pray over our nation. Even as elections are going on, we pray for peaceful, fair, and just elections. That in every polling booth across this nation, God, there will be safety. And assign angels, God, to protect the people who come to vote. Let people come boldly, without fear, without being intimidated, without being coerced to vote for some particular candidate. Let them come with their own minds. And Father, we pray you will move upon our nation, move upon people across our nation to go vote, to exercise their franchise, to be a part of this nation. And God, we pray that people will vote justly, fairly, desiring a good government. And Father, we ask in the name of Jesus that your hand be upon our nation. Take out of office people who are spreading disharmony across this nation. People who are divisive, who threaten, who oppress, who are unjust and unfair. Take them out of office. Give us righteous people. Give us people who will bless India. Give us people who will lead the country forward. Give us a country, Lord, where every one of us can live peacefully, without fear, and where the gospel can be spread across India. Give us, Lord, a good government. And we agree and we pray and we declare over India a good and righteous government. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Let's just take a moment to worship God as we sing together. And then we're going to pray for needs right here. We're just sing a one stanza.
stretch out your hand to heal. Let your glory be revealed. Let every sickness, disease, infirmity, disorder bow when we pray. So in this atmosphere of faith right now, we're going to pray for people who need healing. So if you need prayer this morning, just, just raise your hand up. And remember, other believers are going to come to you and pray for you. So please, just raise your hand up. And if you need prayer for any condition in your body, just raise your hand up. And I will just ask others to come. Two people for each person, please. You see these hands raised? Two for each person. Just just move out. Please move out of your chairs. And look around. There are people with hands raised up. Just go. You, you may say, I've never done this before. It's okay. Today can be your first time. Go do it. Jesus is with you as you do this. So you don't have to be some great theologian. Just a believer. That's all. So keep your hands raised up, please, until you see two people come. I, I see people up in the balcony as well. So people up the balcony, you're also part of this. Just more out. Please uh, go to people who have their hands up. We'd like two people to each person. Uh, just ask them very simply, uh, what can I pray for? Let them tell you in a simple sentence and then go ahead and pray. And as prayer is being made, please be in agreement. Just say, God, I agree. The rest of us, let's agree. Lord, we agree. In this place, let healings take place. Let's be in agreement. We want every person healed. Every person well. Everyone, just pray. Be in agreement in this place. We are in agreement, Father.
Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Now take a moment just to give thanks to the Lord. Father, we thank you. Your word is good. Your word is true. Thank you for the healing administered to every person who needed healing, God. Thank you for the wholeness. Thank you for health and healing restored in their bodies. In the name of Jesus, every yoke of darkness destroyed. Lord, we thank you. And we bless you in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, we understand that uh, many, many, many conditions you will need a doctor to check you out. Uh, you will need to go through some tests and all that. So we understand that. But if something has happened to you right now while people were praying for you, that you can visibly tell and, and tell with uh, confidence that uh, you have been healed or something has happened to you, then raise your hand, please. If you can tell that something happened to me now when people I was being praised, uh, just raise your hand. Let, uh, just We just want to see. Anyone here this morning? Up in the balcony or anyone here, you say, I know something happened to me. Uh, I can tell visibly. I know. Just raise your hand. Otherwise, it's okay. You, you know, if you need to go and get it checked, all that, it's fine. Anyone? Just raise your hand. Okay. I don't see any hands. But what we encourage you to do is, you know, when you know you're healed, either after checking or whatever, please share it, share, send your testimony to us so we can share it with the church, right? Uh, we don't want to be presumptuous. That means we don't want to just simply take a testimony. We want to validate it. We want to check it. We want to make sure it's genuine. But once something has happened, just email us. Send a, send a testimony. So we know God has done something. I know God has done something. Amen. In this atmosphere of faith, God will do things. You go, you check. Once you validated it, send the testimony. We can share it with the church and, and we can celebrate together. Amen. Amen. Let us please uh, take a moment to pray. If there's anyone here this morning, you have never received Jesus Christ into your life. You've come here maybe as a visitor or maybe you've just been coming. But you never received Christ Jesus into your life to be your Savior, to be your Lord. We want to give you an opportunity to do that. So that you can have your sins forgiven. Become a child of God. And know that you have a place in heaven. If you've never done that, just pray this prayer with me this morning. Just say this with me. If you've never done this before, Lord Jesus, come into my life. Forgive my sins. Make me a child of God. And help me to follow you the rest of my life. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Anybody, you pray this prayer with me very first time? If you don't mind, just raise your hand, anybody? If you pray this prayer with me for the very first time this morning, just raise your hand so I can see it. Anybody? I don't see any hands. Anybody? Okay. All right, I don't see any hands. But if you did pray the prayer, on all our exits, there will be people waiting with a red bag. You can just tell them, I prayed this prayer this morning. We have a bag of resources that we want to give to you. You can also take your name and number so we can... Um, you know, and show you or call you and speak to you and tell you how to use the resources that are in that bag. So in case you pray that prayer with me, please make sure you receive that. Let's close, please. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord be gracious to you. Lift up his countenance on you and give you his peace. In Jesus' name. God bless you. Have a good Sunday afternoon and a great week. We trust that this message was a blessing to you. We would love to hear from you. You can email us at contact at apcwo.org. Also visit our website apcwo.org for additional resources. Thank you for listening and God bless you.